University events webinar. This will be the first in a series. My name is Ruth Milligan. For those of you who've been on webinars before, you will recognize my voice. Some of you might have met me at TED Active as well. I'm the coordinator of the TEDx Columbus webinar or TEDx Columbus event and the co-host of the webinar series with Julianne Worm, who's the TEDx East coordinator. But enough about that. Today we're going to be featuring Scott Gilbert and Carol Kitchell, who were the originators and co-organizers, still are I should say, of the TEDx program at the University of Denver, otherwise known as TEDxDU. And I just want to make sure that we have audio connections with Carol and Scott. Uh, here's Scott. Can you hear me? Yes. Welcome, Scott and Carol. And here's Carol. Wonderful. All systems are go. Houston, we have a lot. I'm so surprised. <laughs> um, so before we start, I'm just going to give a few quick housekeeping details. If you have a concern or a question during their presentation, please go ahead and send me a question in your box, your dashboard on the right, or you may send me a chat message. At the end of their presentation, I'll be aggregating your questions and we'll be asking them all at once. And we will be finishing this webinar um, no later than 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, if not before if we've answered everyone's questions. So, uh, without further ado, I was um, hoping to have a poll, but it didn't pull over right, so we're just going to go ahead and let Scott and Carol um, take over. So, and I will be advancing your slides for you today. So, welcome, Scott. Thank you, Ruth. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening to all of you out there. Hopefully, you can uh, hear us okay. This will be a, a two part presentation from Carol and I, and uh, I'll open it up and, and she'll do the rest. And uh, she's even easier to understand than I am. Ruth, I'm going to use the old uh, ding method to go to the next slide. So, ding. Great. I'll pause until it comes up. Maybe it won't pause too long. It should uh, be up. Slide coming up momentarily uh, just outlines our presentation for the day. Uh, we kind of broke today into two quick uh, sections, two quick words. One is why uh, do TEDx uh, at a university, and second thing is how. Uh, and I have two little sections in mind, and uh, simply identifying the benefit to what you want TEDx to do and then uh, selling it in, which is a key part of it. And Carol will spend more time on some of the nuts and bolts, and most importantly, showing how to embed it uh, within the university structure so it becomes an, a regular event, be that several times a year or, or annually. Ruth, I'm still on slide one. Is it changed for anybody else? It's been, it's on um, TED versus TED now. Oh, whoops, let's try this again. There we go. There we go. Okay, got it, perfect, okay. There we go. I wanna to start today, um, the, a little bit of background and character to add even maybe a little levity to the moment and tell you three quick stories about you know our initial sort of conversations and trying to get other people aware of or excited about TED and I think it also helps to set the stage a little bit for how to how to sell it in and how to keep it going. One of the first presentations we made was in talking to the provost and the chancellor and explaining to them what TED was and how it could be great for the university. And those were very long presentations. They then gave us the honor, I think, of speaking to the boards of directors, all very successful and uh, very bright people. And we made an impassioned presentation to that. Carol, Carol did a beautiful job. And we were most of the way through, and, and one of the people in the back of the room, happened to be the chairman of the board, said, would this be a, uh, a TED-like event or like a TED event? And we said, no, this is going to be a TED event. And he stood up and did a very pronounced kind of, woo, that's awesome. This guy's in his 70s, and we weren't quite sure what the, what the situation was, but clearly he knew about TED. And we quickly learned from that uh, situation that there are many folks that know a lot about TED and are bona fide TEDsters, but there's also probably a lot more folks that have no idea. So it raised our antenna to the importance of really being sure we understood our audience. It ends up uh, his son is a 10-year TEDster. His son does the advertising uh, for TED Pro Bono and the Big TED, and his son is also going to be one of our speakers. Long story. Second story we had, uh, which actually uh, was maybe even a little bit earlier on, Carol and I went over to the engineering school at the University of Denver, and we we're seeing some demos of some wonderful projects they're working on 
we're trying to learn more about them, not just for TED, but in general. And the guys looked at us, because we didn't look like engineering types, uh, clearly. And they said, what are you guys doing here? What do you want to know? Really? And they said, well, we're going to be doing a TED event. <laughs> the same thing. There were two of them there. One of them went bonkers, couldn't believe TED was coming to BU. And the other one was still looking at us with that sort of dumb husband look. Well, what are you talking about? And maybe the last one, and sort of the nice one, is sort of going full loop. After we, we did get involved in doing TED and had some really nice light pole banners still up on campus advertising our event, uh, one of the students who uh, happens to be involved with the event was doing a tour of parents and students. And uh, one of the dads kind of leaned over and said, that banner over there says TEDx. Does that have anything to do with, like, the real TED? And she said yes, and, and he was very impressed. And I think I'll make the story more uh, phantasmic when I say that, that student now goes to BU. I just kind of made that up. <laughs> now, uh, let's go Ding, if we could, please. Here we go. And, let, and um, might I say that one person is having a slightly hard time hearing you. I'm having no audio um, issues, so maybe just slow it down just as pitch and make sure that you're um, projecting as, as loud as you can. So. Okay, I will uh, talk louder and slower. Thanks, Ruth. Very good. Excited on the storytelling side. The rest is not quite as exciting. Maybe <laughs> easier. <laughs> the sort of uh, the, the rational side. You know, why do a TEDx event um, is a key question to ask. And I'm going to try to, in this sort of portion of the presentation, talk more about what we did at the University of Denver, why we did it, in, in a very specific sense, to give you real rationale and not to live in the hypothetical. These reasons may or may not be appropriate for you, um, but they were appropriate for us. I think they hope to be helpful in giving you some ammunition. The key thing, though, um, in, in why really ties back to before you get to why we should do it, is what are you really trying to do? What's really the goal? So we tried to start from what's in it for the university? What's in it for the unit of the university? What's the reason for doing this? I really, right up front, want to sort of pause for a second. And I don't want this to sound like we used TED or we used TEDx for BU, although we did. But at the same time, Carol and I are really, really conscious. We both have a lot of branding background. But we try just as hard at when we use DU, uh, we use TEDx to show off DU, we try just as hard to help to uh, enhance and build and expose the TED brand to new people. So we feel very loyal to DU and equally as loyal, if not even more so, to TED because of the opportunity it's providing for us and for DU to so many people. One of the expressions I like to use and may help um, you know, with this sort of connection on why you do a TEDx event is to start with the answer and work backwards. You know, in the end, the answer is you're going to do a TEDx event. Okay? You have to work backwards to what are the things you want to try and accomplish, what do you want to try and do to build up to the end result being we want to do a TEDx event. So ding. So now the specific example for the University of Denver. And um, here, the overall goal for DU, and the reason Carol and I have been very involved with the school in trying to bring some marketing and branding experiences, to raise the profile of DU beyond the region. And the region for us is meant to be the Rocky Mountain region of the United States, which is not a huge region when you look at the whole globe. The Chancellor really wanted us to spread uh, the uh, knowledge of DU and, and uh, information about DU around the world. Our, our goal is, in essence, to bring the university to life, to bring the university's mission to life. And what we talk about at the University of Denver is helpful because this is the reason why TEDx made so much sense. We say at DU, we're striving to improve the human condition by leveraging our intellectual capital to tackle the great global issues of the day. So our TEDxDU event became all about doing and the things we're doing, the things others are doing, to tackle the global issues of the day to show how DU is involved in that. So it was, you know, it, our event and the kind of content we had and the reason why we did it tied very much back to our original goal to spread the, you know, the word about DU uh, around the world. And in the end, you know, for our case, it may be different for you, it was about the university. The DU is a very decentralized university each of the units and colleges acting very independently. We wanted to find something that brought them together and had them act together, and that's what TEDx could do. And I'll mention more about that in a moment. But in itself, very importantly, you know, TED is kind of the future of education in a way, and it's not ironic that TED Ed was just announced recently, because we've always seen it that way. 
It's bringing the power of the web to help educate. And like iTunes University, but more importantly, like you know, Ted, Ed, there's lots of great things going on. I wanted to make sure that BU was embracing the web. Ding. So I'm now going to re uh, review some of the key reasons that TEDx worked for BU, the kinds of reasons you can hopefully borrow or build on for um, recommending and getting approval for your event or taking it further. Ding. So first and foremost, we'll call the first category newsworthy exposure. And in the end, you know, we wanted to use TEDx first and foremost to draw attention to DU. We wanted to show off the universities, research, professors, students, alumni, show off the great things that DU are uh, doing uh, and, and to bring some attention and credibility. In the end, we felt, quite frankly, that having TED involved uh, validates the university further and further validates the people involved in what's going on because TED has such great credential. So the first reason is new worries exposure. Ding. The second thing that worked really well for us is collaboration. You know, as I mentioned earlier, DU is you know fairly uh, decentralized. So we saw that TED uh, the TED at TEDx events could do a great job to bridge silos within the university and quite frankly bridge DU others in the local region and others beyond and even others in other parts of the world. Because of DU, we found out, there were, uh, because of the TEDx event, we found out at DU there were seven different groups working on events in, in Kibera, for example, and that just, and they didn't know that each other were there uh, until we brought them together. We also found in terms of collaboration, it was something really ins instructive for students to get involved in. And it could be, you know, student-only events. In our case, it's students working with administration, faculty, staff, alumni, and even local, local community. And many of the people that got involved in our event had never even met each other before, let alone worked together. It's created this new sort of a thread of collaboration around the university. And, and, and last and not leastly, um, we really find that TEDxDU, we felt, could and, and has um, really helped to you know, reinforce the values of the university. You know, anthropologists say cultures are what they talk about and celebrate, and enable DU to have a real focus on the kinds of things the university is doing, the kinds of things the other, others are doing that the university wants to talk about. There's a real way to bring some sense of pride to the university on how they're helping in the world. And uh, there's been a, so there's a real sense of reinforcing our values and talking about what we believe in. Ding. The next, the next sort of category, once you've identified what your goal is, once you've found a way to sell it in, and to start work on the rational reasons, you're going to have to play with sort of the emotional side as well as far as we're concerned. And part of that challenge is in selling the magic of TED is we all kind of know from our various experiences is that it's really hard to explain what a TED event is like. It's hard to explain the emotion and the energy in the room at a TEDx event. It's hard to explain the emotion in the room at a TED active event in Palm Springs or, or in Long Beach. So that's the hardest part of the whole deal. You know, we laughed um, when we tried to explain to people at the university how great it would be to have a full day of lectures. <laughs> it sounds crazy. They do that all day. They do that every day. But how do we get them to understand and believe that um, lectures could be different? One of the key ways to do that is to get videos buzzing around. You know, it's hard to stay someone, go to the TED, TED site or go to our TEDx site and watch all the videos. But if I send someone or you send someone or a few people a video or a couple of videos that mean a lot to you, it's a really great endorsement. It gets them used to and familiar with the TED Talk format, and it starts to give them a sense of how powerful it can be. And one of the things, you know, that, that uh, we were impressed by out in Palm Springs when uh, Giorgio uh, told a story at the um, TED U site over at the Living Desert, and he talked about trying to pitch a sponsor. And it was a really uh, interesting little story that can be used in other ways within the university. He talked about trying to pitch a CEO of a small company locally on being a sponsor, and he laid down on the table the potential sponsor's business card and his TEDx business card, and he explained to him how much more powerful that TEDx brand was around the world and beyond, and that he shouldn't um, you know, think that his brand was so important, even though it was an important one, the TEDx brand was much more powerful, and that he could help him to tell his story better. And in the end, maybe one of the best reasons to convince people to do a, a TED event to sell the magic is to talk about the precedent 
of all the wonderful university events there have been around around the globe, and the, the numbers are staggering. And if I gave those numbers today, they wouldn't be relevant tomorrow because there's so many events. You talk about things like 11, 11, 11. Talk about things like the uh, uh, Delhi event. There's great precedent that you can call upon for your university. Ding. <laughs> That's my phone that keeps ringing, and I keep hanging it up. Sorry. <laughs> Okay. Um, next thing, I'll let you read this for yourselves. And this is a really nice piece that really helped us to bridge sort of the gap of the last few doubters about the power of TED to take someone like a Hans Rosling, who was virtually invisible, and made him into a virtual education rock star, much along the lines of Susan Boyle, who came from nowhere um, in Ireland or Scotland and became this famous singer overnight. And that's what, you know, through the power of media and television, Ted has taken Hans from a guy who only spoke to 150 students a year, and now he's reaching millions. You can certainly steal that slide. It was a really powerful one for us. Ding. One of the most powerful messages we could give to people, and especially to speakers to get them excited, is to say, when we put you on stage at our event, and there's that big, bold Ted logo behind you, the big bold TEDx VU logo, it suddenly takes your talk that used to be in a classroom or used to be, you know, in a, in a group of people you're trying to convince to join your, your cause, puts it on the stage, puts that logo behind you, and it suddenly gives you incredible credentials that this is the real deal. For all of our people that spoke last year, and some particular examples Carol mentioned, it's really exponentially skyrocketed their progress on getting their cause across. And we really believe not only was their talk the best version of that talk they ever gave, which was helpful, but having TEDx behind it was an extraordinary advantage to them. It took them to a whole other place. And in the end, you may even want to talk to some TEDx presenters to get them to, to help you in, in selling your, your case. Ding. Okay, so in the end, why do a, TED, a TEDx event? It's, as I mentioned, it's very newsworthy, exposure for the university. It gives you a chance for collaboration, improves collaboration to work, brings credibility to what you're doing. It's a competitive point of difference uh, within, within other universities. And in the end, it also kind of reinforces your values. And so we are, are very pleased with the results. In the end, we achieved our overall goal of exposure for BU. We also achieved some benefits that happened faster than we expected. Within the university, people loved it. They said it's one of the best things that ever happened. They wanted to do it again, and they wanted to volunteer. Outsiders now understood BU in a way they never had. They fully appreciated the purpose. They really felt like, especially for alumni, for example, they received a gift back on par with their original education. They really felt a part of something special. So for us, it was a really big success. We were already seeing what was sort of in the back of our minds, our hope for a result of all of our marketing efforts at the university, and that was to get people to seek out BU as a partner in tackling problems. We've had two great examples of that Carol will mention where People are seeking DU out to help solve something they're working on and seek DU as a partner. And I want to turn it over to Carol, who speaks more slowly than I do, to give you more insights into how we think you can create a great event and how you can embed it. Thank you very much for listening. Great. Thanks, Scott. Um, and Ruth, please let me know if my volume is, uh, is too loud or too low. I will. I think you sound OK right now. Take, take on. Go ahead. Then. Great. OK, so ding. So what I'm going to talk about in this part is a little bit about um, what's specific to a university, what resources you can tap into to make your event a great success, uh, ways to look for funding, and then how to create an event that will endure. Because the, it's the sustainability piece. How do we create a TEDx event that will continue to become part of the culture of that university and, and not just be there because of, uh, of the power of your individual personality? So we'll talk about that a little bit more. Ding. So this next slide is a list of the, of the in-house experts that you should look at uh, tapping into. So you are, as an organizer, you, know, you, are, you are putting on a show, right? Uh, universities maybe don't like to think about, the, about it that way, but you are putting on a, a huge event. And you can tap into resources all over the university. Now, this might be your university, or you may be an organizer who wants to partner with a university because they have all of these resources. So I'll try to just go through these quickly. Certainly, 
a university is a great source for speakers. Uh, their faculty members, their successful alums, the students who are there doing amazing things. And we made a conscious decision at TEDxDU to have half of our speakers connected to the university and half of the speakers not connected to the university. People from outside of DU who we thought were doing amazing things. And part of that decision was um, because we wanted to be true to TED and we wanted to be sure that people understood this was not a typical university event. This was not an alumni forum. This was not a faculty showcase. This was TEDxDU, which was something very special and different. And then when we looked at staging of, of our event, um, the universities, of course, have these amazing venues, anything from a classroom size to a huge auditorium. And we used the huge auditorium at our first event, um, figuring that, you know, you're going to put as much work into it to do an event for 300 people, you might as well do it for 900 people. Uh, but our stage then came with lots of people we needed to produce the show. We had a stage manager built in, a lighting designer, a sound guy, um, the stage hands who knew how to get people on and off stage and put their microphones on. So all of that came with the venue. And then the um, director for our show is the head of the theater department. So we were able to tap into those parts of the university. On the video side, um, the communications and news and public affairs parts of the university, they produce interviews all the time. That is what they do for their job. So we were able to just not have to sweat that at all. We knew the caliber, the quality of the video would be first class. They had the majority of the equipment in-house. We did have to hire an additional cameraman, I think, but the, uh, the bulk of the resources came from university departments. And then on the broadcasting side, um, we had the technology. The, the IT department of the university handled the streaming. The woman who produces the athletic broadcasts, so when DU televises a hockey game or a basketball game, the woman who produces that was calling the shots for us in terms of when to switch on the screen from a speaker to a slide to an audience shot. And um, the library folks at DU um, are the resource at DU that tape things in the classroom. So they had all of the equipment for uh, the wireless microphones, things like that, where I never would have thought to go to the library for that kind of um, equipment. So again, more things that we did not have to pay to rent. And on the hospitality side of things, there's got to be a special events group in your university somewhere, right, that produces graduation or homecoming or those sorts of things. They know all the ins and outs about um, whether or not you can use a caterer in a building or whether there's a contract that the university has with some other caterer. And um, in our case, we were worried about not having enough room for our reception afterwards. And the special events folks said, oh, well, would you like us to close off the street outside? Because we do that all the time. <laughs> like, uh, yes, that would be a very good thing. And I would not have thought of that. And I wouldn't know how to begin to get a permit. But again, it's part of their daily job. They also were able to help us um, with registrations and RSVPs. And then the facilities guys, OK, here's a tip. Talk to parking right away. <laughs> Because in our case, our event is in the spring, and there's a lot going on at the university, including many high schools hold their graduations there. So parking was actually at a premium. So we worked with the facilities department to figure out some of those details. And they also knew to turn off the sprinklers outside the theater on the day of our event so that people who were waiting in line didn't get watered. Um, and then students certainly are an excellent source of um, manpower, energy, enthusiasm. We worked with marketing students who helped promote the event. Um, digital media students created some motion graphics for us. Film students produced little vignettes that we used in our program. And then, uh, I'm sure is the case in most universities, there's a pioneer leadership program at DU. And those students um, actually used TEDxDU as part of their spring class in terms of helping us organize the event. And then they got credit for that um, as part of their classwork. Ding. So uh, just summing up the in-house experts, think about every piece that you need to produce your event. And there will be a place in the university where you can get that done. OK, moving on to funding. Everybody wants to know, how much does it cost to do your event? 
And of course, the answer is always, it depends. And I, we don't mean to be coy about it, and um, I, I'm reluctant to throw out dollars in a webinar. We're happy to answer any questions offline. But it really is um, the amount that you'll need to pay for your event depends upon what you want to get out of it. Uh, ding. So for example, in the way um, we structured our event, and um, we lay out your vision. So as Scott already talked about what we wanted to accomplish with TEDxDU, right? Showcasing our alumni and the difference they were making in the world was a big part of our uh, objective. And so therefore, we had to have a travel budget. We flew in alumni from uh, Kenya, from Florida, from New York, from Seattle, and, um, and we, uh, you know, we had to budget for that. Now, that doesn't mean you have to do it that way, right? So um, I went to TEDx Rainier in Seattle, and I, and I believe their stated goal was to say, hey, we have heroes right here in our town of Seattle. Let's focus on them. Okay, then that's a zero travel budget, right? So it, it all depends upon what you were trying to get out of your event. In our case, also, uh, it was important that we were using TEDxDU as a way to establish our global reputation. And therefore, we needed our speakers to be really, really good. So we invested money in speaker preparation. In fact, we used Duarte, uh, who works with TED, for a few of our speakers um, to make sure that they told tight stories and that their slides um, were effective. Now, uh, that, that was a significant expense last year. And we learned a lot. And this year, uh, we're still investing in our speaker prep, but we're doing it on a different scale because we have more confidence in our ability to coach our speakers and to do graphic works uh, to have that great end result. So that's a place, too, where a budget can shift depending upon your goals. Um, service to the community. We wanted DU to charge for their TEDx event. Certainly there's a precedent for charging for TEDx events at universities. Uh, but the university said no. We consider this part of our obligation to give back to the community, and therefore our event is going to be free. So as organizers, we love that very noble gesture, but that means we have no ticket revenue to work with. So again, this is the sort of thing where you need to look at your university ahead of time and decide. And as I say, we, we would still like DU to charge for this event, but that's not going to happen. But um, there's absolutely precedent for charging different rates for um, students, faculty, the general public, and that can affect your budget as well. And then my last point on here, which is uh, not meant to be a disparaging in any way, right? So this our event is presented by the university, underwritten by the university, and therefore um, there is an expectation about uh, the event and how it's delivered. And that means, you know, open bar and plenty of food and beautiful monitors and that sort of thing. Um, there are other events at universities that are um, organized by students, um, held in more casual places. Still fabulous events. I'm not saying that they're not fabulous events. But that might be an event where you'd have a um, no host bar or something like that. So again, it is looking at what you're trying to accomplish with that event. So moving on to the next page, next slide. So just as an example um, and how our events have evolved. So our big TEDxDU event last May was about 900 people in this beautiful auditorium. The team that put, produced it was from all over the university. It was five hours long. We streamed it live and we had lots of um, cameras on our shoot to get that great video. Um, next slide. Um, this year, we realized, gee, we still have a lot of people who've never heard of TED. So we've added on these TEDxDU salon events. And in this case, these events are much smaller. We're having um, three of them. We have our third one in April. And they're really meant to be almost little commercials for, for TEDxDU, our big event in the spring. These are about 100 people. They're organized by students, for students, so the public is invited. They're an hour and 15 minutes long, boom, in and out. A couple of videos, a couple of speakers, a little taste of TED. We shoot them with a fixed camera so that we can put the videos online. But these have, have basically no cost, right? So we produced this big event in May uh, with a budget. These ones that happen, these salon events, basically, next page, excuse me, next slide, sorry. 
when we lay out our vision for those salon events, it's really about making people familiar with TED. And in that case, there's a small team, there's no travel, there's no uh, speaker perks in, in terms of a special coach or a special designer. Uh, we offer, we can get burritos for free. So the dollars in those kinds of things are negligible. We also, you know, we already have t-shirts from our big events in May. So we're able to do those events uh, with virtually zero budget. And um, any university, you can start in either place. You know, we started big, we've gone small, but we'll still have our big event in May. And we're looking at doing more salon events um, next year because we've kind of figured out the system now, really. Okay, next slide. Um, how to get funding. And um, certainly every event, this is an issue for every event, uh, universities have some um, particular things that we've learned to look for. Okay, so one is you have to find out how your university works and get them to waive the internal charges. So um, like many big companies, uh, if you want to use the video guy for your department, he's going to charge you back for his time. At DU, if you make it what's called an institutional priority, uh, then those departments are not allowed to charge each other. And that does two things. One is you don't have costs, and the other is it makes it clear to all those departments that the university wants you to cooperate. Um, and that goes a long way to uh, making things easier. The other thing is, as Scott talked about earlier with objectives, is find out what individual departments want to do, and maybe you could get them to kick in a little bit. So for instance, the alumni office always wants to find some way to engage recent graduates. And a TEDx event is the perfect way to um, attract recent grads back to DU or to get them to watch it online. And they might kick in some funding. Or admissions office, right? Everybody wants those same top 10% of the kids who represent diversity, the highest SAT scores, whatever it is. They have those candidates that they really want to land. Okay, well, why don't you invite them to come spend the afternoon on campus at your TEDx event, right? And maybe admissions could see clear to throwing a little money um, into your budget for that. Or in fundraising or development, you know, the engineering department wants a new building. They should invite their major donors to come over and uh, spend the afternoon at TED, hear all the cool things that are going on at your university, and maybe they'll uh, then contribute a little bit to your budget to produce the event. Um, also, tapping into alumni, um, recent alums who are successful, they, they love the university, they want to find a way to give back. Uh, you can see if you can hit them up for cash if you have somebody on your team who loves asking for money. Um, or you can hit them up for in-kind support, you know, anything from food to furniture, you know, for your lounge areas. And then a, a final source here is existing university sponsors, and I'll do this with a ca uh, caveat that you have to watch out for the um, internal politics there. Don't approach any existing university sponsor without alerting somebody else at the university first. But for instance, if there are companies who sponsor the sporting arenas or a speaker series at the business school or some other section of the university, that would be a place to turn to look um, to really use it to their advantage to deepen their relationship with the university and to reach a specific kind of person. Um, my net here, so we can move on to the next slide, is to is to don't freak out about your budget, right? Because you uh, can craft the event you want with the money that you have available, and they are it will always it will still be fabulous. Okay. Last section, I think, maybe, is um, how to make it sustainable. And because really what you want to do is create a legacy at your university, right? It's, it doesn't happen just because you guys are pushing it to happen. You want the university to see the value in it, and you want a TEDx event to continue long after you're gone. So uh, here's some uh, advice that we've learned. One is about who to put on your team so that you can keep it going after you're not there anymore. Okay, first is um, find some internal advocates uh, because they will really help you grease the skids. In our case, we had the chancellor of the university. That's a pretty good internal advocate. But it can also be a faculty member who says that TED is a great thing and that they use um, TED Talks in their classroom all the time. 
or it could be somebody in the communications department who agrees that this is a great way to raise the profile of the university. You basically need somebody on the inside who is going to be your champion and put them on your team. Um, the academic endorsement piece is really important. Uh, you need faculty to get on board and they tend to be a little jaded and we learned that um, it was very important that the provost of the university, right, who was the lead academic in the university, supported this idea. Because there are people who, who think that scholarship and entertainment are on opposite sides of the spectrum. And what TED, the miracle of TED, is that you were able to take learning and make it absolutely fascinating. And that you have to convince people of. So. Um, the academic credibility of TED is important, and you need somebody who represents that part of the university on your team and to say that. Um, student evangelists, absolutely, so uh, you can spread the word. They spread the word better than, than anyone in terms of uh, the importance of TED and um, how much fun it's going to be. It's helpful to have an outsider for perspective so you don't get too much uh, navel-gazing as a university. So in our case, we had um, we have a, a, an architect in the city of Denver who's a designer and a huge TED fan, and he actually sought us out um, when he heard that we were doing TEDxDU. And he, it's just great to have somebody else to bounce ideas off of um, and somebody who really purely represents the TEDster without any ties to the university. And then like any team, you need to make sure you have your serious doers uh, versus your volunteers. So producing the event is a really big time commitment. We have lots of people who volunteer to help, but really what they can give is you know, a couple of hours day of. So you want to make sure that you've got people on your team who can actually dedicate a few hours to it. So um, the next slide is really about then how can you create that continuity from one year to the next. And the first point, of course, is to love your supporters, right? You have to lavish that love on anybody who was good to you and supported the idea of your TEDx event. Make sure they stay in the family. You'll have a lot of those naysayers who come around and say it was a fabulous thing and they knew it all along. you got to love them, too. Um, some organizations use that sort of first vice president model where somebody's in charge and then there's a second in command who the next year takes over responsibility. That's a great way to set up continuity if you can do that. Um, we're also exploring having um, a student club actually adding TEDxDU to the recognized student clubs, just like the photography club or the ski club. We have a TEDxDU club where we can um, always draw volunteers from and hardcore workers from. And then that group continues over time. It becomes part of the student organizations at the university. Uh, you're going to need fresh energy because it's, uh, it's exhausting putting on a TEDx event and after a couple of years you certainly want to be able to tap into that expertise and that institutional knowledge that is developed but you're going to also need to add new folks every year to keep it fresh. And then the last point about continuity uh, that we found is really you need to keep TED visible on campus as much as possible, right, so that next year you're not starting from scratch. And we feel like we feel like with our event last May, you know, we turned on this small segment of the university who had never heard of TED and now think it's the most amazing thing. And each month we can do a little bit more and bring more people into the fold. And it's also important to continue to merchandise TED with the people who supported you, the people who funded you, or the administration, or the departments that supported you. So uh, when there's an article in Fast Company that calls TED the new Harvard. You send that to everybody uh, who supported you. When there's something in the Harvard Business Review, you send that out. When Ariana Huffington writes about TED, you send that out. So you really need to merchandise uh, the TED, uh, TED as a long-term relationship with the university on a regular basis. Okay, um, Okay. next slide. And I, I know we're going to run out of time. Um, what did it do for DU? I think the most important thing, you know, we knew it would give us exposure. We didn't expect um, the change in attitude on campus. This was clearly not business as usual. DU had never done anything like this before, and people just loved it. It made them so proud of the university and so excited to be there. Next slide. Um, it also, as, as Scott mentioned earlier on the next slide, 
we didn't realize that the university doesn't come together very often, right? I mean, even graduation, which is a university-wide event or homecoming, only touches a small segment of the population. This was unique in an academic effort that involved many, many parts of the university. And there were new collaborators, faculty members who had never met, didn't even know each other's departments existed, uh, you know, now had new relationships. DU's also embracing this new format, right? This uh, short talk that is entertaining. We have lots of uh, faculty members who didn't make it on our stage, but we're taping them anyway. They say, I'm going to write a talk in the TED format. Will you come tape it? Because I can use that to um, you know, further my scholarship. And so we're doing that through the communications department, really embracing this idea of how to take your scholarship and make it entertaining and easy for a lay audience to understand. Uh, there's this sense of pride in the university. And again, this, this reaffirmation of the values. It's turned out to be a great example for DU of them wanting to make a difference. And the next slide, just a couple of um, quick stories. We had uh, Kim Gorgon spoke about concussions last year, and Ted actually picked up her talk. And now we're working on an initiative that, that uh, creates a bracelet. When somebody gets a concussion, their doctor puts it on them. And when the doctor says they're cleared to play, the doctor takes it off. But it, it uh, brings awareness to concussions so that the, the, uh, the athlete, the community, the teachers can all know to take special care of this kid. On the next slide, um, Aaron Huey is a photographer. And he showed his pictures of the Lakota Indian tribe. That Ted picked up this talk as well. OK, he is now doing an outdoor campaign where um, Ernesto Urena and Shepard Ferry, Shepard Ferry did the Obama Hope poster, are turning some of Aaron's photographs into woodblock prints. And they are going to be a billboard campaign in Washington, DC. OK, that is 100% comes out of his exposure at TEDxDU. And you will have stories like this coming out of your TEDx event. Some amazing connection is going to happen that you will be able to leverage for the university's benefit. OK, last uh, next slide. On our site, there is uh, a video of our chancellor, Bob Kuhn, talking about how important um, TEDxDU is to the university. So you should know this is on our site. It is a tool for you, because sometimes hearing it chancellor to chancellor might be the easiest way to get it sold in. And then, ding, because we're all insiders and we know Nancy Duarte has told us that we have to end with the new bliss, right? So if somebody said to you, I need to find a way to raise the profile of our university using social media in a way that enhances our reputation, makes us global leaders, engages us with this incredibly intelligent, like-minded community, you would have to create a TEDx event. That would be the answer. So um, we're happy to talk to you more. That is the end of our official presentation, and we can take any questions. Carol, thank you so much. And Scott, thank you as well. We are uh, have about 15 minutes left for questions. So let's do this. I have a few questions in the queue, and we're just going to chat through a few of them. And if you have questions while we're talking, please feel free to go ahead and type them in. Um, it's the easiest thing for me to do right now is to take them that way, so type them into your question box. So um, the first is there was a, there's a participant who has exactly the opposite, uh, that the uh, Dustin is running his TEDx program from a grassroots student organization, and they don't have the buy-in of the university yet. Now, I will say that in um, May, we will be working with the TEDx USC organizer who has um, graciously agreed to sort of coach people on how to make the pitch. While Carol and Scott have outlined all the benefits and the rewards and sort of the theory and approach uh, from the 30,000 feet um, picture, Ian from USC will actually be um, giving us hardcore sort of, he's got a very ritualistic way in which to make the pitch to the administration. So I don't want to go into that too deep, but I figured since you probably have had this um, question come to you having been in a university setting, um, what would be, from your perspective, the one thing to tell Dustin and his student organization um, to, to impress upon them about why they should be embracing the TEDx program? I mean, you've gone through a whole bunch of stuff here, but what would be the one thing that he could really anchor some of his um, energy on? 
Um, I'll jump in, of the course, what a surprise. Um, I would say, Justin, or Dustin, sorry, um, don't waste your time with anybody who hasn't heard of TED. There's just way too much uh, education to happen. Go find somebody in the organization who is already a fan and work with them to uh, use their credibility to reach the next group of people. But when you start cold, it's going to take you, as we know, it's going to take you five months. So you got to go find the people who are already on board with TED and use them to help uh, sell in your program. So I think that that's the biggest little thing. Lauren? Yes. Lauren? I'm going to, I'm unmuting you. Sorry, I didn't give you warning. <laughs> Um, I have a question and I'm going to direct it to Lauren from the TED office and not to put you on the spot, but um, maybe you, can you just tell us, there's a question about, is there an easy way to find all of the other uh, university-based TEDx events? Um, not currently. We don't have, we don't currently, um, that's something we're working on on our website to be able to give university events a university quote event type and then you'll be able to search events by um, their event type which would be university and easily be able to find the other TEDx university events. So that is something that does not currently exist but that we are looking to incorporate into our website and search function into the near, in the near future. Much like you guys, uh, this is again just a, um, much like you guys have your speakers in a spreadsheet, is there a, an existing spreadsheet of every TEDx event that's ever happened in the past because they're not always, um, do we have access to something like that? I don't want to open up a can of worms, but that may be somebody um, could. No, there's no spreadsheet. I mean, there, the spreadsheet I guess would be the website is kind of that database, right. I guess. Um, could possibly look into a list of TEDx, of, of talking to our team and seeing if it's possible to release a list of TEDx University events, if that's um, a possibility we want to go to. But on the TEDx website, that's the database. You can search past events and future events, and you can search university and college um, that way. We, we are, it is really, yeah, it is definitely our hope and something that we're really pushing for to have university be an event type. So that's much easily searchable by university events. Right, and thank you, um, James. He just reminded us that the big list of websites and Facebook pages within the uh, wiki actually is not a bad place to start either. Yeah, that's true. I wonder if um, maybe this could kind of start an initiative where university events just start adding themselves, create a section for university events, and you guys all add yourselves. Um, there you go to that list because that would be a really helpful resource. Well, I think we have an action item from this webinar. <laughs> um, so for those of you that haven't been in the wiki, please um, make sure to pay attention to that function or that uh, resource that exists. You should have your own separate login once you've gotten your TEDx license. Is that correct? I, I, I got licensed two years ago, so I I can't remember exactly when you get notification of those things. Yeah, so yeah, once you get your license, you'll get access to the wiki um, in about a, about a week from when you're Great. licensed. Okay, so thanks for letting us divert a bit on where to find, sorry, I didn't mean to scare you there, Lauren. No, it's, no, it's okay. Totally cool. Uh, and is there anything, since I have you, um, Lauren, was there anything you wanted to add, now that you're... Um, that to Carol and, and Scott, don't feel like you have to, but as I'm looking at the next question that just came in here. Um, no, I think, I think Carol and Scott have a really um, great idea of how to run a university event. I guess the only thing that we at TED are interested in on um, things like that, of what we resources that you know, we can provide or you guys can build that can kind of resources and information that can kind of help you guys do this. I mean, this webinar is one of the first steps towards that, is to have something that if you are a university event, we can, you know, send you to this webinar and you can get this kind of basic information. But any other ideas like that, we'd love to hear. Great. So I'm going to um, actually answer a question in the meantime. I'm going to unmute Dustin in one second. Dustin, if that's okay with you, I, I see that you've got some interesting um, perspectives I think at the University of Minnesota, that makes sense, it's hard to read. Um, there's been two or three questions 
that have come through about the limit on the 100 attendees. And I know I can answer this, but since Lauren's on the line, I will let her um, explain why there's that limit and what you can do to get it changed. So yes, there is a limit of 100 people um, on TEDx events. And only if the primary licensee, it's not the co-organizer, it's not someone that's a mentor, it's not um, someone who's speaking at your event. If the, pri the primary licensee of the license has to have attended a TED conference in order for you to have over 100 people. And we realize that this is an issue, especially with un universities, there are a lot of people, but it's there, there are a few reasons for this. Number one, it's good to start your event small. When you're getting into this, a TEDx event is very different, as Carol was saying, than kind of other events that happen on campus. And I think it's good to start small with this event to kind of see the scope of it and to really understand what it means to have a TEDx event. And number two, because this was kind of when the rules for the TED program were being decided, this was one thing, one element that um, the TED team really thought was integral for people to be able to have a large-scale event is to attend a TED conference and to really understand the kind of DNA and the work and the many elements that go into a TED conference that can really only be um, really be learned by going and seeing all the moving parts. And I think any one, I know um, everyone on this who's on this webinar, Ruth and Carol and Scott have attended TED and they can kind of speak to that. That you know, I think your event before attending a TED conference and after might have some different elements. So that's kind of one of the things we put in place to make sure that you guys, if we are giving our brand away, that you really um, understand um, the brand in that way. And I'll just add that my um, organizer uh, for two years before I attended a TED event had been to TED about five or six times. And her overlay in our planning was so significant in changing the dynamic of how certain things were organized. And I can't even tell you all of them, but um, even just in the way the host operated or the introductions to the speakers, and especially the overlay on how you choose your speakers and to make sure there's no um, promotion or commercial commercialization. Um, and then having attended a TED event, I can tell you I have a whole different philosophy on the, on the, on the uh, attendee experience in addition to the speaker selection and what goes on the stage. So um, we have about five minutes left. I just want to make sure we've answered all your questions and um, Dustin is actually, I'm probably, it looks like he's pulling together, and I'm just going to unmute you, Dustin, for a second, because I think what you've written here is um, kind of interesting. So give me one second to get your name up here. So Dustin, are you there? Yes, I am. Why don't you go ahead and tell us you were um, writing here in the, my very small screen about sort of a panel of champions, and to answer your question, we're happy to, to, to be, um, now I'm going to unmute you, though, for a second really bad feedback. So that sort of trumps, sorry, the ability to talk to you. I'm going to give you one second to turn off any speakers you have. Let me try it one more time. If I still hear feedback, we're going to probably just let you talk offline. So Dustin, are you there? Yeah, can you hear me okay now? Uh, yes, okay. better I think. Okay. Um, yeah, so we've had a, yeah, the Board of Champions is basically uh, because we are, we are a bunch of students, none of us have actually attended a TED before, and so we, we, we understand that the TED ex experience and TED experience is supposed to be vastly different. And so um, we've been working with uh, Adam Mikola, who's attended a TED himself. I'll be talking with another person who actually runs TEDxTC out here in Minnesota um, as well. But our hope is to build a board of champions of people that have, um, have experience in running TEDx as well, have experience in running other conferences. Uh, have experience in event planning, logistics, design thinking, creative direction, all these things. Basically, people have a lot more experience than we do to help advise us. And um, I guess the question I was laying out was, um, if there are people that have experience in this that would be willing to uh, hop on board or provide kind of a, a consultation or be open, say, you know, I have a competency in this area. If you want to contact me, please do. Maybe post your information on that wiki or you know, hopefully extend, like, hopefully I can contact you guys after this seminar so um, we can hit you guys up with, a, you know, advice or questions that we may have along the way here. Sure. I think that, um, Lauren, you want to just take that in terms of the mentors, and I know that Carol and Scott would probably be willing to answer questions. I'm going to go to the next slide. Uh, I think it has our email address. Yep. 
Let me do that while Lauren answers. One of the two things on what was the conversation was going on. One of the question about if you can't get a university approval, you know, and Carol suggested don't waste your time with non TED initiated people. I agree with her. I'd also say at some point just do it. Have a really small event and you can start that way. We find the energy in our salon events is in some ways just as great as the big energy and in each salon event appeal to different people. And now when we go tickets go on sale for next big event, there'll be different groups of people excited for different reasons. So just starting small is fine. We happened to feature an athlete recently, who did a wonderful job. That's a whole group of people who might not have known about us as teammates who came to the salon event. And the last thing, I think we learned a lot by going to other TEDx events and TED before our event. We finally learned even more after our event because we realized now the place we could polish a little bit because we saw other pieces in action and it keeps and TED keeps evolving. So it's just great. And you know, if someone said they want to come to our event, we'd find a place for them to stay. We'd make it as cheap as possible. I think there was a great sense of community uh, evident in Palm Springs that we're all so willing to help each other because how great TED's been to all of us. We can make it a really low cost sort of business. Lauren, do you just want to touch on the um, how there's some mentors that are out there? Um, yes. Yeah, so I'd, I'd like, I'm sorry. I think oh, people have volunteered to connect mentors. And, and the person who spoke before, I think you also wrote something on the Google group. I think you, am I correct? Is he still on? He started a thread on the Google group about, um, about university events and other events kind of started getting involved. Am I I've right? unmuted him. So let's just, let, we have 30 seconds left. Oh, so okay, but we can so, take that um, offline. Okay. And, so on the, on the wiki, there is a section where um, people can um, put forth to be a mentor to other TEDx organizers and that you can contact them there. So if there are people who have run university events before and would like to be a mentor, please, uh, maybe in a follow-up email, we can add the exact link there. We, you can please do add your name there and then other university events that are just starting, you can um, go on there and find you know, university events. And you can also ask us as well, say, I want to be set up with a mentor and we can um, connect to you. Or even you can go on TED.com and search other university events in your region and um, contact people through their TED.com event page. So there's that place on the wiki, you can connect with us. Or you can just reach out to someone who you feel is in your region or who you feel's event is similar to you and just contact them directly and ask. So in the um, interest of time, it is 3 o'clock. We started a few minutes after. But I want to make sure that we um, take a minute to thank Carol and Scott. They uh, really took some time out of their days to prepare this presentation. So thank you both very much for sharing your insight. It was an excellent place to start for university webinars. Um, we will be having at least two more webinars around universities, one featuring the SMU um, TEDx and the next featuring the USC. So SMU is in Texas, USC is in California. For those of you who maybe not know all the acronyms here in the States, um, we will attempt to lean into the university topics from different angles. Um, definitely at SMU we're going to learn about their kids program. And at USC, like I said, Ann's got some experience in helping to reinforce and pitch this administration if you're working from a grassroots perspective on up. Obviously, Carol and Scott have been working from the grass top down. Um, Lauren, is there anything else you'd like to add, or Carol or Scott? Thank no, you. we're good. Thanks very much. Thank you yeah, all thank you. very much. This will be archived on the TEDx Learning Resources webinar series on the TEDx site um, within TED.com. Uh, we look forward to uh, your participation in future webinars. Thanks very much, everyone. Take care. Have a great day.